Morning. Our, uh, our speaker this morning is Kevin Wright. And I want to read to you his bio, which he wrote. Kevin has been in ministry for 20 years in various avenues. He's done several years of youth ministry, campus ministry in a couple of places, church planning in Lima, Peru, and he's been preaching now for several years. I've never seen anyone do more with less ability and talent than him. If Kevin Wright can do it, truly anybody can do it. Seriously, anybody can do it. There's Kevin's bio. Uh, I think back on uh, Kevin and I's relationship, I've known him for over 20 years. That, that's enough to count. And I would say that truly nobody could do what Kevin Wright has done in some of the contexts that he has ministered in. And by that I mean at different times and in different people's lives, he's been, perhaps you'd say, the only friend, a true voice, a person of faith. I went to college with Kevin, and we ran around with a group of guys who, a wild and crazy bunch, very diverse, very different, very foolish. And in all of that, Kevin was known as the man uh, with his faith. And he had a respect in that regard. That respect lasted for years. And I know stories more than a handful of guys who in those times didn't necessarily make or choose the things that maybe Kevin would hope for them to have chosen. But 10, 15 years down the road, baptized into the name of Jesus Christ and began to build godly families. Many years down the road, still call them from time to time and say, hey, brother, here's what's going on. What do you have to say about that? What do you think? And so he's got a long game of being in the right place at the right time with his faith and, and making the most of that. What does that look like for me? Well, I went to New York City right out of college and aspired to be an actor in New York City. Some of y'all have heard those horrifying stories. But I found myself at one particular point there in New York City very low. And it's because I looked at my life and where it was and what was going on and realized this is not getting me to where I, I want to be. But how do I get myself out of it? What do I do? And Kevin came on his own dime to make trips and visit me in New York City. He'd call me, or I'd call him, and we'd talk from time to time. And one time I get this package, and it's got cassettes in it, and it's got books in it. Some of those books I still have, but at that particular time I needed to read those things and hear those things. Here's a song that was on that particular cassette tape that arrived to me at a very low point, and I listened to this song over and over. And it's a song that comes from the point of view of a guy saying, it looks like you need a friend. Oh, it looks like it's got to be me. It's a song by Sting. And it says, if the night turned cold and the stars looked down and you hug yourself on the cold, cold ground, you wake the morning in a stranger's coat, no one would you see. You'd ask yourself, who'd watch for me? My only friend, who would that be? And then the person says, you know, it's hard to say it. I hate to say it, but it's probably me. When your belly's empty and the hunger's so real and you're too proud to beg and you're too dumb to steal, you search the city for your only friend. No one do you see. You ask yourself, who could it be? A solitary voice to speak out and set me free. I hate to say it, I hate to say it, but it's probably me. You know what? You're not the easiest person I ever got to know. And it's hard for us both to let our feelings show. Someone would say, I should let you go your way. You'll only make me cry. But you know what, if there's one guy, just one guy who'd lay down his life for you and die, it's hard to say it, but in your life right now, it's probably me. And I heard that song coming to me from Kevin. And it was true. I had no friend. None at all. And I listened to this cassette, and I called him. I said, Kevin, I need something for my spiritual growth. And he said, I'm going on a mission trip to Mexico. I said, I need to go. And so we made plans for that, and it fell on a particular week same week that the president of the company I worked for invited me to come and visit with him about a promotion in that job. And so I called Kevin. I said, Kevin, I don't know what to do. These, these two weeks are lining up on the same time. And he said, well, just pray about it. You know, you told me you needed this for your spiritual growth. Just pray about it. Choose what's most important and do that. He laid a choice before me. And I chose to go on that mission trip, went with him, and that has changed everything from that point onward. I'm here, I have a family in Peru, a family here, I've been in ministry. The people I love, wouldn't trade anything in the world for are all this side of that decision. That's how I would sum up Kevin's ministry. He's faithful with what he's got. 
He speaks and lays before people a choice time and time again, and then he waits and he hopes. And sometimes they choose what he would like and dream for for them in terms of the Lord's purpose, and sometimes they don't. And sometimes he doesn't get to see whether they do or not. But that's ministry, being faithful with what God has given them. And he's done it so well. Brother, love you. If I'd say two words that define his ministry, I'd say significant and I'd say eternal. Come and preach the word, brother. Is this customary? Is that, are we supposed to do that? Okay. Good morning, guys uh, and lady. Nice to, nice to be here this morning. Um, Paul, I'd forgotten a lot of that stuff, Paul. That's old friends tend to bring stuff up. But I'm not going to bring some stuff up about you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what Paul didn't tell you is, is when he was trying to make that decision. Corey, what's up, man? Uh, he was trying to make that decision between his job and going on this mission trip to Mexico with me. I had sent him to motivate him to come to Mexico because he'd never been a picture of the mangiest, starving dog in Mexico and just sent him a little message, come to Mexico. His business meeting with his boss was supposed to take place in Hawaii. So he put pictures on the fridge. Postcard of Hawaii, beautiful, blue water, and a mangy dog in Mexico. And he said every day he'd look at it and go, which one of these am I going to do? <laughs> and thank God, he chose mission work. And everything's changed because of that, powerfully. Uh, here's what I want to do. I, do I get the time back from Paul's introduction, by the way? <clears throat> yeah, it's gone. Please turn to Zephaniah. Zephaniah is where we'll start. I want to share with you an experience I had. And by the way, where's the clock? Oh, there's the clock. Charles, what was the time on this? Five after? Is that right? Five after? Okay. Okay. Here's an experience I had recently. I, after the campus ministry, youth ministry, church planning, uh, I had the chance to raise my kids two houses down from my mom and dad. The, the pulpit position came open there. So I moved home to Holdenville, Oklahoma to preach. One of the first things they asked me to do, well, we had a ladies' class every Wednesday. And the ladies came and said would you teach our class? And I was like, yeah, absolutely, let's do it. And it has turned into my favorite, maybe my favorite part of the week because it's me and 15 old ladies just opening up the Word of God, no time limit, no set schedule, and we just dive in and drink. And it's fun, and it's funny, it's great. But here's what happened one, one time. I was preaching through the Minor Prophets or teaching through the Minor Prophets. I was trying to get it all done, one prophet per hour, hour 15 minutes so sometimes I was really hooking it up we came to Zephaniah and Zephaniah the prophet again is he's delivering a message of, of doom the Israelites were doing wrong again at this point in time they weren't just worshiping idols they were somehow mixing the worship of the holy God along with a worship of the starry host and Milcom, which I think is a, uh, I think Molech and Milcom are the same guy, so he was worshipped by child sacrifice. Horrible things. Mixing in the holiness of God with the unholiness of this idol worship. And so Zephaniah's message is destruction. God is going to enforce his covenant of blessings and curses, and the curses are coming. And then he moves it from Judah to all their enemies. And he talks to Gaza and Ashdod, and he's saying, doom is coming to you too. Destruction is on the way. Chapter 3, he's back to Jerusalem and saying, bad things are going to happen because of your sin. But then he hits this part. Look in verse 12. But I will leave you a humble and lowly people. They will take refuge in the name of the Lord. The remnant of Israel will do no wrong and tell no lies, nor will a deceitful tongue be found in their mouths. For they will feed and lie down with no one to make them tremble. Shout for joy, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away his judgments against you. He has cleared away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You will fear disaster no more. In that day it will be said to Jerusalem, Do not be afraid, O Zion. Do not let your hands fall limp. And then we get to chapter, or verse 17. And 
And I was reading it out of the New King James at the time. I was teaching out of the New King James. So I want you to see this verse as I saw it then and as we studied it. God is saying, you've done wrong, but when I bring you back, you're going to be a changed people. And this is what he says. The Lord your God in your midst, the mighty one, will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. Now remember, this is, this is a class of about 15 ladies. All of them moms, most of them grandmothers. And, and we hit Zephaniah 317, and we start picking apart the language. Uh, this doesn't come across in every translation, but right here, God says, once I save you, our relationship is going to be different. He says, I'll rejoice over you with gladness. I'll quiet you with love. Rejoice over you with singing. We started talking about what class of people are rejoiced over with singing and quieted with love. Now, this is not a ladies' chapel, so it may be a little more difficult to get there. What? Babies. Babies. Right. I mean, that's, that's kind of the picture it painted. And we dove into that picture, and we started talking about their babies. And each one of those women had held countless babies. And if you've just watched a woman holding a baby, it's almost a miraculous thing. They're just holding that thing and that thing. Okay, I'm a guy, right, okay. They're holding the baby and just looking at that baby with love, and if, if the baby's upset, they quiet it with their love and rejoice over it with singing. That's the only class of people I know that get to experience this. And so we plumbed the depths of that, and they told me about their babies, and they told me about their grandbabies. And finally I said, okay, when you think of how God looks at you, is that the picture you get in your head? And there was an audible sigh. <sighs> And one woman on the front row literally hung her head. And I realized that most of those women in there who are precious, loving, godly women, they're selfless and generous. If you try to add up all the good, selfless acts those women, women had done in their entire lives, you couldn't tally it. And yet, when they thought about what God felt when he looked at them, all they could think was, to God... I am a disappointment. And it made me mad. I wasn't heartbroken or sad. I was angry that that had happened. Because that was a crime. Those women are so precious and so loved by their God. But somehow, in their heads, they were thinking, God doesn't love me as much as I love my own children. I just disappoint Him. And for the next four months... From every angle, from the pulpit, uh, from classes, from prayers, from home Bible studies, I attacked that concept of just trying to convince them that God loved them. And, and at one point in the, the, con, uh, the conversation with those ladies, I asked, what makes you think you're a better parent than God does? What would make you think that you loved your own baby more than God loves you as his child? We were doing something wrong at Holdenville and had been doing it for years. These women, each one of them, probably could have quoted verbatim Acts 2.38. They, they could have told you the five steps of salvation. No problem. Rattle it off. They could even go five acts of worship. You know, they could quote all this stuff, and yet they could not say with conviction, yes, God loves me. How did we miss that point? Of all the points we could miss, how could we miss that point? So anyway, here's what I want to do. I want to look at this. We, we have cultivated, at least in Holdenville there, the wrong picture of God. So what I want you to do is turn over to 2 Samuel. Maybe pushing the wrong buttons here. 2 Samuel 14. Uh, this, is, this is about King David. He has an interesting uh, encounter with a woman. David is sitting on the throne... As king, he's also serving his job as judge, and one day a woman comes to him, and she is <clears throat> frantic, and she is heartbroken. Here's what she says. Well, look in, look in verse 4. Now when the woman of Tekoa spoke to the king, she fell on her face to the ground and prostrated herself and said, Help, O king. The king said to her, What's your trouble? And she answered, Truly I am a widow, for my husband is dead. 
Your maidservant had two sons, but the two of them struggled together in the field, and there was no one to separate them. So one struck the other and killed him. Now behold, the whole family has risen against your maidservant, and they say, Hand over the one who struck his brother, that we may put him to death for the life of his brother whom he killed, and destroy the heir also. Thus they will extinguish my coal which is left, so as to leave my husband neither name nor remnant on the face of the earth. This woman comes to the king for judgment, and it is a horrifying story. Her husband's dead. She has two sons. They get into a fight. One kills the other. Now everybody's rising up, and they want to kill her last son. Extinguish the final coal that provides light and warmth to her. Now, in this day and time, that would have been her support system. That would have been her final support system. And she's about to lose not only husband and son, but her final son. Heartbreaking story. One problem. It is a complete and bald-faced lie. It's not true. She comes to him with this heartbreaking story and lies to him. Look at his response. Verse 8, Then the king said to the woman, Go to your house, and I will give orders concerning you. The woman of Tekoa said to the king, O my lord, the king, the iniquity is on me and my father's house, but the king and and his throne are guiltless. So the king said, Whoever speaks to you, bring him to me, and he will not touch you any more. Then she said, Please let the king remember the Lord your God, so that the avenger of blood will not continue to destroy. Otherwise, they will destroy my son. And he said, As the Lord lives, not one hair of your son shall fall to the ground. He's saying, Look, I will take care of this problem. He doesn't know it's a lie. I'm going to take care of it. I'm going to take care of it three times. He's saying, I'm going to take care of you. Verse 12. Then the woman said, Please let your maidservant speak a word to my lord the king. And he said, Speak. The woman said, Why then have you planned such a thing against the people of God? For in speaking this word, the king is as one who is guilty, in that the king does not bring back his banished one. David had a problem himself. A horrible thing. One of his sons raped one of his daughters. One of his other sons killed that son and then fled. As a father, that's a nightmare situation to go through. But still, he longed for that son who was far away from him. The people close to him could tell, this is breaking his heart. This is destroying him and tearing him down. He longs for his son to come home, but he won't bring him home. And this woman is saying, when you say you'll take care of me, you won't even take care of yourself. Keep reading. She says something powerful here. Verse 14. To back up what she just said, she says, For we will surely die and are like water spilled on the ground which cannot be gathered up again. Yet, God does not take away life, but plans ways so that the banished one will not be cast out from him. Let me ask you, when you think of God, is that the picture that you have in your head? Too many of our people I am discovering are walking around every day, and the picture that they, when they think of God, what they think of is that He doesn't really care. An arm's length God. He's in heaven, you're on earth. He did the work, you know, He's he's established grace, He sent His Son. You're on your own. Don't mess up again. A lot of them walk around with the idea that God is sitting on His throne, waiting, maybe eagerly, for them to mess up so He can drop the hammer. Bam! Bam! That's what my poor ladies were thinking. They were thinking, uh, man, God, I've messed up. I've messed up. I'm just a disappointment to him. Their picture of God was, I can't wait for you to mess up because you're out. Here's what David heard. God plans ways to bring the banished one home to him. That's a God not sitting back, ignoring humanity or not a God eager to drop the hammer. It's a God sitting on the edge of his seat looking for those who are far away and going, how can I bring that one back? So-and-so is far away. He's, he's lost. He doesn't know my son. How can I bring him back to me? The, some girl somewhere is estranged from her creator and he is planning ways and devising schemes and thinking up ways to bring people home to him. Maybe 
Maybe so-and-so needs a relationship. Somebody's lost. I'm going to put a relationship in their life to guide them the way I want them to go. That's been true for me time and time again. I'm going to organize a circumstance. I'm going to bring together an encounter to bring somebody who's far away from me home. You say that even in the New Testament. Uh, when Paul is in Athens, and he's telling these Athenians about that unknown God. Turn over, Acts 17. Turn over to Acts 17. We'll, we'll just read it. Okay. Look at verse 24. He starts telling them about this God, the God who made the world and all things in it. Since he is the Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything since he himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on, the, on all the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation, that they would seek God, if perhaps they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. Look what it's saying in verse 26. God determines the times and the places people live to give them a means to find Him, that they might grope for Him and find Him. He puts them where they are and when they are so that they can come to know Him and come to have salvation in Him. He's not a God who's disconnected. He passionately can, cares about bringing people home to Him. He wants all men to be saved coming to a knowledge of the truth. That puts my life and your life in a very certain perspective. That means our happenstance meetings might not be happenstance meetings. God may have put us there, put a relationship in our lives, put an encounter in our lives to help bring somebody home to God. To bring that banished one back. God is passionate. He wants people to come home to Him. I'm going to tell one more. Go ahead and turn to Luke 15. And I have five minutes, so I'm going to blaze through this. You know the story, so uh, I may not have to get into too much detail here. Luke 15. <clears throat> Jesus is spending time with the tax collectors and sinners, and the Pharisees and scribes don't like it, and they begin to grumble and complain. This man receives sinners and eats with them. The religious leaders of their day looked down on them. How would that affect you if the people that you looked up to as holy, godly people thought you were worthless and to be avoided? And what would that make you think God thought about you? And if these people are so holy and godly and they don't like me, maybe God doesn't like me. Jesus tells three stories to tell people who his father is. He tells one about it sheep and a shepherd he tells a story about a woman and a lost coin and then in verse 11 he gets to the prodigal son man had two sons and the younger son came to his father and said give me my share of the estate so he divided his property between them now this would have been horrifying because what this son is basically saying is dad i want your stuff I don't want you. I'm tired of you being in control of it. I want, I want your stuff more than I want you. And, and so that father who's wiser than me in the parable divides his property, which meant that only two sons, he would have gotten a third of everything that father owned. He would have had to liquidate assets to give this all to the son. He takes it, goes off with it, blows it in wild living, burns through it. He finally gets to be master of his fate, and in charge of that money, and he ruins it. You guys know the story. He ends up feeding pigs, and he's so hungry that he's wanting to eat the, what the pigs are eating. And then something beautiful happens. Scripture says, when he came to his senses. When he, when he woke up and realized what he was really doing. When he got a clear perspective on things, he said, I'm going to go back to my father. I'm going to say to my father, I've sinned against heaven and I've sinned against you. Make me like one of your hired men. So he begins that journey home. 
And while he was a long way off, his father saw him and he ran to him, embraced him, and kissed him. His son was home. He doesn't run to the son and grab him by the shoulders and say, I'm glad you're home. Where's all my stuff? Right? That would have been what I would have done. Hey, where's all my stuff? Because to a father, stuff's not important. Sons are important. When we were, pre- pre- <clears throat> we were preparing for the mission field, um, w- with our mission team, one of the girls on our team was pregnant. And, and they were going to have their first baby. And they knew it was a girl. And they had already had her name picked out. But she was struggling with some self-esteem, some insecurity, some fear that went along with that. And we were going to a Christian psychologist. And, and he asked her, do you love your baby? And she said, yeah. Kid wasn't even born yet. Thing wasn't even born yet. No. And she said, yes, I love my baby. And he said, why? Because she always does what you say? <laughs> no. Because she's so obedient and, and dutiful and oh, is perfect? No, no. How could I? She's not even born yet. And he said, why do you love her? And she said, because she's mine. And that's the crux of it. Look, folks, your God loves you. Not because you're perfect, because you're not. Not because you always do the right thing and say the right thing. Not because you follow the rules perfectly. He loves you because you are His. When that, when that son came home, the father, he starts the spiel, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. And the father just cuts him off, says to his servant, Go, bring the best robe, put it on him. Ring in his finger, sandals on his feet. He's a free man. He's home. He's my son again. Kill the fattened calf. We're going to have a party and celebrate because my son was dead. Now he's alive. He was lost. Now he's found. And they had a party and celebrated. Music. Dancing. True celebration because the son came home. Listen. God loves you the same way. Uh, I was reminded, I was talking to a friend of mine last night. Um, We had a man from World Bible School come through and preach to us. And he shared a story that was heartbreaking. He said there was a woman that he knew he'd grown up with in church. She was like the matriarch of the church. A woman who had been faithful to God for decades. And she had some money, but she was extraordinarily generous and made people's lives better. She was compassionate and a great example, but, but she was on her deathbed. So he, he went to her, and he was wondering the whole time, what is this godly woman going to, to say to me as she is about to meet her reward? And she said, he's at, her, he's at her bed in the hospital, and she said, I hope I've done enough. I hope I've done enough to go to heaven. And he said it it just ripped right through him to think that she had been living all those years with that curse hanging over her. Not knowing that God didn't love her because of what she was doing. God loved her because she was his. Here's what I'm saying to you, brethren. As you're going to go out into the mission field or work with youth groups or college kids or preach in a pulpit... Wherever you find yourself serving, your people need to know that God loves them. In fact, one of the, that's got to be one of the top three things you're telling them, right? Oh, God is powerful. God is forgiving. God loves you. I mean, it's got to come out because somehow that message got lost. And we cannot ever, ever, ever allow that message to get lost. People need to know it. So let me ask you. God loves you. Do you believe it? Do you believe it? You live like it's true, and you tell them. That's my message today. Thanks, fellas.